Hi everyone, welcome to the Magnets uh, series of seminar. Um, the seminar format is a usual 20 to 30 minutes uh, presentation during which you can keep your microphone muted, please, and turn off your video. Um, then we have 10 to 15 minutes time for discussion. Uh, you can also write in the chat your question um, and there's gonna be time to catch up in the end, which is not recorded. So for today, I'm really happy to introduce you Katie Bristol, uh, who's going to talk about um, fast and furious magnetic drift using quantitative polycycular variation techniques to quantify the tempo of large igneous province. Um, so now I'm going to share my screen. Please, Katie, feel free to share yours and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, so first off, I want to thank uh all the organizers for putting this together and um, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, my name is Katie Bristol and I'm a PhD candidate at the University of Florida. And today I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about uh, some of our work in the uh, Deccan traps to um, try to constrain the, the tempo at which uh, large igneous provinces are in place. Okay. So large igneous provinces are these regions with uh, very enormous accumulations of igneous rocks that are in place relatively quickly. Um, and due to their size and uh, their relatively rapid formation, uh, they have the potential to influence earth systems through the emission of volcanic gases such as CO2, SO2, and other minor amounts of uh, toxic gases and acids. And they are also temporally linked to some of the most dramatic events in Earth history. Uh, so things like mass extinction events, uh, periods of rapid climate change, and other um, major environmental perturbations. Um, so as shown in this diagram, this is the, the relative ages of some of these events to the formation of lips. Um, so for example, with the, the Deccan traps, we see that um, occurring during the uh, KPG mass extinction, um, etc. So, uh, but how how and whether these um, large igneous provinces directly play a role in these events has remained kind of debated because the finer details of their formation are not known. Um, so for example, one of the outstanding questions is how rapidly are they in place and do they erupt continuously or in pulses? Um, and this information is very important because many volcanic aerosols have relatively short residence times in the atmosphere. Um, so therefore, we really need to know the tempo of emplacement to assess uh, whether they could have accumulated in amounts um, sufficient to affect the environment in this way. Um, so one common method for constraining the timing of large igneous provinces is magnetostratigraphy. Um, and in the case of the Deccan lavas, almost all of them are represented by Cron C29R, which lasted about 500 to 600,000 years. Um, and because large igneous provinces tend to erupt fairly quickly, um, magnetostratigraphy provides two cores of a time resolution. Um, and then in addition, it can't account for intermittent volcanic eruption history, which uh, could be hiding some of these major hiatuses in the emplacement rate. Um, however, large igneous provinces do have minerals which can be used for high precision dating. Um, and here we see the plagioclase argon dates for the Deccan group with two sigma uncertainty. Um, but in this case, the ages are limited by the resolution of the technique. So what we end up with is a range of ages with overlapping uncertainties through hundreds of meters of the stratigraphy. Uh, and this obviously enters our ability to quantify the time elapsed between flows. So <clears throat> at best you can get around 10,000 year uncertainty, but it's not uncommon to see uncertainties on the scale of tens of thousands of years, or even up to 100,000 years or more. So overall, this kind of resolution is just not good enough to understand how Earth systems respond to large volcanic events like the emplacement of a large igneous province. Um, so some of the <clears throat> climatic and biosphere responses are relatively quick, so on the order of individual eruption timescales. And absolute geochron uh, cannot identify the time between individual lava flows unless the time between flows is relatively long. Um, so it's clear that we need an additional chronometer to address this question. Fortunately, there is another uh, magnetostratigraphic method that can help us constrain 
um, centennial to millennial time scales in large igneous provinces. And this is called secular variation analysis, which relies on paleomagnetic data. <clears throat> so real quick, for those who aren't familiar, um, secular variation is the natural variation in Earth's magnetic field direction and strength, which occurs over relatively short time scales. Um, so over time, the geomagnetic pole performs sort of this random walk about the geographic pole. Um, in, in Robert Butler's famous book, he uses the analogy of a drunk staggering around a light pole to describe this behavior. Um, so paleosecular variation uses these changes in the position of the pole to generate a relative eruption history. And to provide an example, this figure depicts the change in the position of the north geomagnetic pole relative to the geographic pole over the past 2,000 years. Um, so each time a lava erupts, it's going to record a snapshot of the magnetic field at that time. So it can be assumed that lava flows that record similar directions must have erupted on timescales shorter than secular variation. Uh, and these groups of lava flows with similar paleomagnetic directions are often combined into directional groups, as shown by the colored circles here. And then when you couple this with um, information about the lava flow stratigraphy, a relative eruption history can be constrained. However, this eruption history is only qualitative and it cannot provide absolute time constraints. So it can only really tell you which lavas erupted together and which didn't. Um, and first, I'm going to walk you through some of our data and um, show you kind of what we would be getting if we looked at it uh, in this conventional way with a, uh, like a more traditional paleosecular variation um, technique. So um, in May of 2022, we performed uh, field work in the Deccan. Uh, we worked primarily in this uh, Moderon GAT uh, because it has been well dated um, its stratigraphy has been mapped, and because it provides an opportunity for us to assess the tempo of the Deccan pre-KPG. Um, and this gap was previously studied by Shanae et al., but it needs uh, better stratigraphic control and sampling resolution. Um, so during our field season, we redid the stratigraphic log, and we mapped and documented flow morphology throughout collected over 250 paleomagnetic samples and almost 50 cosmogenic samples. Uh, and we also sampled around, uh, or greater, more than 40 lava flows. Um, in addition to collecting for Cosmo and paleomag, we also focused on some of the other aspects of the lavas that can help us infer time. Um, so one of these is lava flow morphology and the lobe boundary morphology, um, where Kind of the shape and the structure of the flow and the nature of the lobe contacts can tell you how long a flow cooled and how it interacted with the flows below and above it. Um, so for example, we saw um, some fused lobe boundaries, which suggests that the lava was still hot when the flow uh, above it was in place, or the, the flow below it was still hot when the one above was in place. Um, and conversely, we also saw some sharp transitions, which imply that the lava would have been fully cooled before the next flow was in place. Um, and then there are also bowls, which are shown in this lower photo here. And these are thought to be weathering horizons, which would indicate more time between emplacement. Um, and then in addition, we also sampled across different chemostratigraphic boundaries, where there is some assumption of um, some time between the tapping of uh, different chemically distinct magma reservoirs. Um, so now to look at some of the paleomag data. So we sampled the Madaran section, which is encompassed by Narol in purple, and Takravati in green, Dimashankar in blue, and the Kandala in brown. Um, so we also have some results from Bushi and Bulletpur, but that's not going to be uh, the focus here. We're just going to be looking at the Madaran data. Um, so all these lavas are foliatic basalts, and so these formations are based primarily on chemistry. And like I said, I want to walk you through some of the data and show what kind of results we would get with a more conventional PSV analysis before I get into our quantitative model. So if we break it up into the individual formations, um, we see at the base here the directions from narrow were fairly consistent, which sort of implies that they may have erupted relatively close together in time. Whereas in Takavati, uh, it looks like we have multiple directional groups that could suggest more time between flows. With Dima Shankar, we only had a few sites, but we do see more variation than in Narrow. 
Um, and then in Candala, we sampled um, a smaller portion of it, but we see similar groupings that could indicate um, we may have had some longer hiatuses between flows. Now, if we look at the boundaries between these formations, uh, we see directions that suggest some time between Narrow and Takravati and between um, Bhima Shankar and Kandala. Um, but we see very similar directions between Takravati and Bhima Shankar. So overall, I would say that the chemostratigraphic boundaries don't necessarily indicate time in this case. So going back to what I was saying about the lava flow morphology, here is an example of some flows that had fused lobe boundaries. Um, so again, when they're fused, we assume that that lower flow had to be still hot when the upper flow was in place. Um, and this is reflected in our directions, um, which show that this set of flow flows were um, have nearly identical directions. And so they were probably erupted very close in time. Conversely, here is uh, a red bowl and um, some bowls showed quite a bit of difference between the flows, such as this one in Candala. And this is sort of what we would expect, uh, given that bowls are supposed to represent these weathering horizons. So you would expect uh, quite a bit of time to have passed between these two flows. So however, we did not see this with all bowls. So here is actually a bowl doublet where we have uh, a red bowl on the bottom and then a green bowl on top with a thin lava flow in between. Now the A95 is quite large on flow 13, um, but 14 and 15 are pretty close. Um, and I wanna point out that some PSV studies define a directional group as any successive flows with overlapping A95s. And some studies maybe place a constraint on A95, for example, only considering those less than 15 degrees. Um, but in both of these cases, this would be these three flows would be considered a directional group, but I am gonna come back to this in a moment. Um, so overall, we see results that are consistent with Kron's uh, C29R where it would have been erupting in the Southern hemisphere near the reunion hotspot. Uh, we see overlap in directions between distal samples, which is good, um, but there was a variable amount of change in directions between flows. And we see that uh, Chemostratigraphic boundaries are not necessarily a good indicator of time. And using this conventional approach um, to paleocycular variation means that the bowls don't necessarily mean anything either. So overall, there are questions about how to define a directional group and how is that gonna affect the overall analysis. Um, but you can see that it's really difficult to truly assess hiatus durations in this way. So some of the other issues with a traditional approach to paleocyclic variation is one, um, is the approximation of roughly two degrees per 100 years reasonable? And two, even if it is, uh, we must consider the fact that real paleocyclic variation is not smooth or regular. So we see um, a lot of fluctuations, some of them slow and some of them fast. And then uh, another issue is that uh, one of quasi-cyclicity. So if we have two flows with similar directions in succession, how can we be sure that it isn't just due to the pole wandering back around to that location over some more extended period of time? Uh, and going back to this diagram I showed earlier as an example, um, here we have two directions, which if you looked at them alone would look very similar, but they are actually just coincidentally in similar places at very different times. So to improve upon traditional paleocycular variation analysis, we are developing a new technique that combines uh, paleomagnetic and geochronologic data to develop quantitative predictions about eruption tempo. So this method utilizes a generalized forward modeling approach to compare synthetic eruptive histories from real secular variation records with magnetic data sets in a Bayesian inversion framework. Um, so this mitigates both of the issues I just talked about um, the one with assuming a constant and steady rate of change in direction, and then also the issue of cyclicity. Um, so this approach can assess the most likely eruption history, uh, including the duration of eruption, eruptive pulses, active eruption time, and uh, hiatus durations between pulses. Um, and so, for example, if a large igneous province erupted rapidly and continuously, we might expect to see a high fraction of the lavas in directional groups and a high number of lavas per directional group. 
Um, and then on the other hand, if it was very pulsed, we would see a higher number of directional groups overall, um, but a lower number, uh, lower mean number of lavas per directional group. Um, and so I just want to quickly go over how our model defines directional groups. Um, so those are only, we only considered those with alpha 95 less than 10 degrees in our model. And then uh, we calculate the angular distance between the site mean directions of each pair of successive lava flows along the section and compare it to the threshold given by the square root of the sum of squares of the alpha 95s. Um, and so we only consider those with angular distances less than 10 and sigma less than 10 as potential candidates for single eruptive events. And next we move up and explore whether including an additional flow above that provides a new mean that satisfies this criteria. Um, so as an example, if we had flow one and two here, we have um, both angles are less than 10. And then if we add an additional flow, we still satisfy the criteria, but if we add a fourth flow, uh, both of those criteria de deteriorate to greater than 10. So therefore we would include flow one, two, and three in the directional group, but not four. Um, so here are the results from our model with all of the paleomagnetic data. From bottom to top of the Moderon section, we obtained eight sets of lavas that satisfied our criteria as directional groups. Um, the number of lava flows per directional group ranged from two to three with a mean of 2.13. And overall, uh, 17 of our lavas fell into directional groups, which is roughly 55% of them. And because our model also takes elevation and stratigraphic thickness into account, um, this is roughly 27% of the stratigraphy being in directional groups. Um, so if Moderon erupted rapidly, you would expect a much higher fraction of the stratigraphy being in directional groups, but that's not what we're seeing here. Um, so this suggests that Moderon was not erupted continuously, but in pulses. Um, but real quick, I wanted to come back to this. So obviously the alpha 95 on flow 13 was too high to be included in our model, but one of our directional groups was flows 14 and 15 which is sort of an issue here because of the bowl, which is supposed to be a weathering horizon. Um, but if we look at the data broken down by sample in flow 13, uh, we can see clear evidence for a baked contact or remagnetization. And this makes sense given how thin flow 14 is. Um, so here we can conclude that flow 15 uh, remagnetized flow 14 in the top of flow 13. And therefore, we exclude this from our directional groups. Um, and this highlights the importance of considering these other possible indicators of time, such as bowls, um, when looking at this data. Uh, so here are the results with that directional group excluded. So we now have seven directional groups and a, a slightly lower fraction of the stratigraphy in directional groups. Um, but overall, in, in excluding that group didn't change um, the statistics too much. So what does all of this mean? So we ran this model on other existing paleomagnetic data from LIPS to see if there is any difference between them. Um, and we do see some grouping of behavior in some of them, but importantly, our results are generally consistent with Shanae et al., which indicates that Moderon erupted in pulses. And given the range of directional group statistics, uh, we expect that the typical time between eruptions in Moderon is between six to 9,000 years. Um, however, to get a more robust prediction, we need to finalize our new stratigraphic log and add more volcanological and cosmogenic information, which is currently underway. So in addition to directional analysis, we also did some paleointensity experiments. Um, so for this time frame in the database, we have four other studies, um, two of which are on Deccan basalts. Um, this most recent paper from Deccan by Radhakrishna et al. found very low paleointensities at around 65.5 MA. Um, and our samples are around 66. Um, you have to kind of take some of these ages with a grain of salt because um, a lot of them are just assigning the age based on the KPG boundary and not necessarily um, like independent geochron data. Um, 
So for our initial experiments, we just ran one specimen from each flow that had stable directions and did not exhibit any high temperature demagnetization behavior. Um, and we used the ISI protocol. Unfortunately, we only had five of the 30 flows which passed any of our selection criteria. But I will point out that some of them failed due to some sagging in the RI plots, which um, we're hoping they may be candidates for BICEP. Um, so here are the results in the selection criteria we used. So using the same criteria as uh, Radha Krishna et al, we had four samples pass, um, but their selection criteria was somewhat loose and they also did fit um, a much lower temperature component than we did. So that might explain a little bit of the difference in the, the numbers here. Um, next, we used uh, PyCrit 03, um, but I think that these samples really needed to be checked for curvature, so some something like a K prime parameter. So then we used both um, MyCrit and SeatCrit to check for this, and we only had one flow past those. Um, but we are currently running uh, 56 additional specimens, so hopefully we will have more results coming soon. So just to show you some of the examples of the prime intensity results, uh, I've grouped these by the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, so first is the good. Uh, this result is from NARL, and it actually passed secret and gives a field of around 33 microtesla. And this is about five times higher than that result um, reported by Radha Krishna. Uh, the bad are some of these flows, which looked like this. Um, these did not pass the selection criteria at all. Um, but we are running more to see if BICEP can uh, help provide a corrected estimate, since it seems to be that the big issue here is kind of a sagging in the arrive plot. Um, the value of this fit here, which again, it didn't pass um, selection criteria, but um, it's about 27.1 microtesla, so it's a little bit lower than our other one, but again, um, maybe BICEP can help us here. Uh, and then the ugly are these ones, which unfortunately was how a lot of them looked, and we aren't going to be running any more that looked like that. Uh, so in, some initial points that I can say about this is that um, Deccan samples are very challenging paleo intensity targets. Um, so they've been sitting around in a super humid, wet environment for millions of years, and um, they like to alter when you heat them. <laughs> um, and because of that, they, they're not included in our uh, PSV study right now. Uh, and also our initial values are much higher than those uh, recently reported for the Deccan by Radha Krishna. Um, but again, they fit a much lower temperature range than we did here. So that might explain some of the difference. Um, we do think that uh, K prime or some other curvature parameter needs to be included in the selection criteria for these. Um, but regardless of the results, uh, we will uh, or getting these results will help us with the cosmogenic analysis that we're going to be adding to the model um, because cosmogenic nuclide production rates are modulated by magnetic field strength. And I'm happy to talk more about that if anybody's interested. But um, So in conclusion, uh, chemostratigraphic boundaries don't necessarily equal time. Um, bulls and lava flow morphology are important indicators of time and should be considered in PSV analysis. Um, stratigraphic control is really important, and this new model will be a valuable tool for assessing the tempo of LIPS. Um, and some of our future work is we're finishing up some more DMAG experiments to increase N um, and doing some more paleo intensity experiments, uh, which will complement our cosmogenic analysis. Um, we're going to be finalizing our new stratigraphic log to improve the control on that, and then integrating all of this with um, our model to uh, improve the overall resolution. Um, so thank you for uh, listening to me, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Let's give Kathy a big round of applause. Um, now there is time for questions. If anybody has questions, please uh, feel free to raise your hand. Uh, uh, or type it in the chat if you want. Kathy has a question. Hi, Kathy. Hi. Nice talk, Katie. Thank you. 
Um, it's nice to see somebody try and address these questions of what group directions mean. And um, it's also kind of uh, disturbing in a way to see that we don't still don't really know what they mean. Um, I was uh, wondering, you, you mentioned the possibility of uh, looking at rates of change in various time varying models of the field. And we know that those rates of change are really going to be big underestimates. And so you had a, a number where you said you thought that uh, two degrees per 100 years might be reasonable. And uh, anything that was more than 10 degrees apart would be could be considered uh, a new sample that was uncorrelated. And, and I just wanted to kind of um, think about a reality check on that. Um, if we look at, uh, for example, in uh, the Goofum model, which is probably our best representation of the modern field, which of course we don't think of as typical, <laughs> um, the, the peak rate of change that you see in angular variation there is around 0.4 degrees a year. So if you imagine that going 10 degrees all in one direction, <laughs> that would be like 25 years. So I guess I, I think it's worth thinking about, is 25 years long enough? What do you think? Uh, that's, that's, that's the real question. Do, do we get an independent sample over that time interval? And um, is, this, is this gonna work, <laughs> I guess? Um, what, are, what is the, the question here? Um... I guess the question is, um, I, I really appreciate the fact that you're trying to get a, get a handle on how you can get an independent estimate of the magnetic field. And I suppose my question is, what is an independent estimate of the field, right? I mean, I know we have all these rules of thumb that if you can average your specimens and get a direction that's distinctly different between two flows, then you can consider them independent samples of the field. But I'm just wondering what we really think that would be. Right. Um, um, and that's kind of one of the, the challenges here, I guess. Mm -hmm. in, Paleosecular variation analysis, like directional groups have been defined so differently across so many different studies. And that's part of the reason why we wanted to incorporate these real mm -hmm. paleosecular variation records. Um, and while they are downsampled and somewhat smoothed in this way, it um, I think it provides a better estimate of, I mean, realistic change in the field that we would see versus just using like a, a number. Um, mm -hmm or kind so, of you know, incorporating this time series in the way. So if I can go on, sorry, to for monopolizing this. Um, if you were to, does it make a big difference to your estimates of, I mean, ultimately you'll end up with something that looks like a VGP scatter for these directions, I guess, over the interval that this is erupted. Does it end up making a big difference when you when you merge things into directional groups? Um, I guess I'm not quite understanding what you're asking. Okay, um, if, so... If we combine in directional groups versus not, or... Yeah, versus not. Um, I mean, I think the directional groups here, at least, the, the big thing with this model is that they're kind of um, a proxy for how many, like, eruptive events you had or how many mm -hmm. like, stages of eruption you had. So okay. um, ha like by looking at the number of directional groups uh, over the whole, like as a fraction of the stratigraphy, that helps us kind of figure out, um, you know, because like, like, like I mentioned, if you had, you know, a continuous eruption, we would sort of expect there to be like a very low amount of directional groups, right? Versus if you had, um, pulses of eruption, you're going to have a higher number of directional groups. So that's kind of the, the function of that here. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Um, I don't know if there are the questions in the audience. There are now two questions in the chat uh, that I can read out. One is from Garima. Uh, they say, nice presentation asking uh, which methods have been followed for paleointensity measurements? Uh, so we used the ISI protocol, which is um, the modified double Delier technique that 
um, employs both infield and zero field uh, steps along with PTRM checks. Um, and we did this because it um, it has these built-in checks for, for non-ideal grain size behavior, as well as um, alteration during heating, which we expected might happen with the Deccan samples. Um, so that's that's the method we use, the ISI protocol. Thank you. I have another question in the chat, and then we're going to take uh, a Richard question. So Priyashu says, says, great presentation. And um, how much time is being considered for a ball to form to include in the edge model of Deccan traps or PSD-based models? Um, so we don't have estimates on the bowl formation time, um, but we use the Geochron data throughout the, the stratigraphy and, to bracket the, the top and bottom ages. So that gives us a, a duration for the PSV model, but the individual ages of the bowls um, are not necessarily being considered here. Okay, thank you. Uh, Richard? Hi, Katie. Really enjoyed your presentation. So my question is actually kind of close to, to Kathy's uh, earlier. Um, and it kind of does get to this sort of question of what are these directional groups? And I think, you know, the, the challenge to me is what makes, you know, something like the Deccan different than GUFM is, is the recording material, right? We have a geologic rock that has some processes that we are also interested in what's going on. Um, and so I guess that's sort of where my question was with, uh, you mentioned that this Bayesian inversion model, I'm just wondering, do these include properties that look at sort of the recording materials as well as separate from the time scales that the field is varying versus sort of the other parameters? Um, so do you mean like looking at like lavas versus yeah, like if it were a sediment model, we'd be talking about lock in depth and DRM. And I'm just wondering, does your framework have something similar, even though these are, are obviously lavas and have a different formation? Um, so this model was made specifically for large igneous provinces. So it pretty much designed like for basalt. Um, so I don't think that it would be applicable to like a sediment record. Okay. All right, thanks. Thank you. Any other question? Oh, I don't see other questions. That's, uh, uh, oh, you have a message. Riesha says thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, actually, Priyashu's presentation is also was about balls in the Deccan traps. If you missed it, you can watch it on the on a YouTube. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to check that out. Bowls sure. are really interesting, very weird things. <laughs> yeah, they be recooked basically. So <laughs> and it's very nice your result that shows that actually the the cooking is going also more than the just the bowl. So yeah, <laughs> very interesting. So any other question? Yes, uh, Zheng, sorry, I don't know how to pronounce your name. Yeah, that's Go ahead. correct. Uh, hi, Katie, a uh, very great talk. I just wonder, like you mentioned, you sample the same level across the uh, distance and uh, what's the like uh, alpha 95 for that uh, same level? Uh, like if you sample the same level of the lava from two places and when you compare the direction from these two places, what's the typical like alpha 95? And what's that compared to your threshold, like 10 degree? Um, do you mean if if we sampled the same contact, but at different Yeah, elevations? like same marker bed or like same bed that you can trace for a distance and you have two samples and you compare their direction and what's the difference? And what's that compared to your 10 degree uh, cutoff? So I don't know, like right off the top of my head, but I do know that there were a couple contacts that we sampled at different elevations where you can tell based on um, these things called GPBs um, that we were sampling or, or like sometimes you could trace the bowl through 
um, the whole thing and they would have similar directions. Um, but I don't know what the, the A95 are off the top of my head. Okay, so, but uh, you, you uh, they should be very similar. Yeah, um, you would, I would think okay. they should be similar. Yeah. Um, in the case of the bold doublet here, we did have that really high uh, alpha 95 on the um, lower flow there. Uh, and that was because based on the exposure, we had the, it was really close to the baked contact, right? Um, where we sampled that bold doublet at a different location and we were able to to sample much farther into the flow so we didn't get the baked um, contact making the alpha 95 bigger. Yeah, because I wonder like uh, we, so you have assumption here is that when you, when you have these directional groups and if their directions are very similar to each other, they must erupt relatively at the same time. Um, but looking at uh, Rob Butler's uh, like a random walk plot, uh, at some duration, like they they have very similar directions. Certainly within ten degrees, uh, 10, 10, 10 degree, right? So I wonder, like, uh, like when we have two very similar directions, does that mean they must have no time in between, or there's a lot of time in between? It's just the field is not changing. Uh, and whether we can include that in, in the model. Uh, and also like for this 10 degree uh, cutoff, how you change the, how you de decide to use this value and uh, have you tried to change this value a little bit to see how that gonna affect your final results? Um, yeah, so that's kind of the, the purpose here of our model is that we're, instead of just relying on alpha 95 values, we're using like real paleo secular variation data and comparing it to our magnetic data. Um, and but the secular variation data, is, is this from the model or from, the, from some model which is very young to your rocks, right? Um, so we used, I think it's site 1335. The IODP uh, IODP, core? Yeah. Yeah. But, uh, but that's... Uh, we did test different models and the results were pretty similar um, regardless of the model that we used. Mm, yeah, but yeah. I mean, it's good to have some uh, model that's at the same age, but it, it is sedimentary core and how that gonna compare with the lava record and if there's the aliasing effect of the sediments, right? Yeah, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, there's than... definitely some <laughs> caveats and, um, I guess some other yeah. considerations that need to, I mean, it's not a perfect uh, model, yeah. but. Okay. All right, yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I guess we work with what we have, right? <laughs> <laughs> yep. Okay, so I guess we can uh, uh, now maybe give Katie another big round of applause. A very good presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> And um, yeah, I'm gonna just uh, share screen. Obviously, if you have any question, probably you can contact Katie or look forward for papers. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna just share the screen in a moment. So we're gonna have um, a break for EGU, then we're gonna have Brendan Riley in May. Uh, we we have some slots available in from June to August. Please get in touch if you are interested. And you can find this talk and the previous talks on the Magnets uh, YouTube channel. Um, so yeah, thank you very much everybody for joining. Thanks again, Kathy, and uh, see you next time. <laughs>